Well, hello again. Oh my goodness, it's been so long since the last time we recorded. And if anybody uh, watching now has seen any of our chats, you know, we generally don't go this long without uh, recording something, but here we are. Um, a lot has happened in the last few months, holidays aside. And uh, I know for at least a couple of us, job changes or impending ones aside, uh, I've also, I've had a son And so that was a huge impact to my last few months, but really just over the last year. Um, so a lot has gone down for us all personally and professionally. And so I'm very happy to be getting back in the swing of things with my my marvelous uh, co-conspirators over here, Nicola and John. Um, and I, I personally, with the birth of my son, have been sort of out of the industry a little bit. I would say I haven't been following along as closely as I normally would. So I, I figured maybe this would be a great opportunity for us to kind of catch up and just sort of rehash some important moments from the last year or so, or maybe some fragrances, whether they're new or not, that impacted you in any particular way over the last year or so. And I'm just kind of curious to know what's going on with, with the both of you and fragrance. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to bring Fragrantica Talks back and uh, always happy as always to uh, be chatting with you both. It's it's absolutely great to have you back as well, Adam. Um, I was just saying I've I've really missed our chats and I've really missed you both. So I'm really pleased that we're getting back into the swing of things. Um, John, do you wanna do you wanna start? Do you wanna start us off? Sure. And yeah, same here. Um, Nicola, it's great to see you again, and Adam, great to see you as well too. And um, so excited to hear about your young child. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, sure. I, I, I wanted to say something kind of funny about um, just the process of uh, perfume releases across across the year, which is so interesting and a little bit comical in some ways is that I think every year I, I kind of have these three points in the year uh, looking at perfume releases. So I start off the year with a bang and I say, this year, I'm really going to keep on top of all the releases. And I I start off with a spreadsheet saying, okay, new releases of the year. And I and I write things down as I see them come out. And I see articles on Fragrantica and, and other places just saying, you know, new perfume comes out, this thing, or this release I hear about on Instagram, something. And I take notes. Of course, I kind of fall off in my duty. And then about middle of the year, I say, get back at it, John. Get all the, the missing spaces you forgot about. And I about July, August, I pick up again. And then, of course, I, you know, fall off a bit end of the year about November, it's like, oh my God, I have to really catch up again. You know, so anyway, it's always interesting. And what is fun though is about November-ish, I do do this big assessment of all the, the the stuff that's been released and I smell a whole bunch of stuff. And it's kind of fun. And I like that sort of becomes my um almost like holiday rush in a way of like what happened during the year. Um, but I enjoy it because I, I get tons of samples and I end up buying a couple of bottles here and there and everything. But um, I thought last year was a really good year for perfume. And I thought um, there was a lot of interesting things that came out, but I wanted to start with um, something that I believe that you also mentioned Nicola as a, a fragrance that you liked. And that was uh from uh that was delta venus that came out from eris and i believe you mentioned this as well if am i right as a perfume but yeah um which i thought was a great 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 fragrance and um what's interesting is i really was convinced that it was great through smelling it because you know a lot of people have been talking about it um and i got the sample and i wasn't quite sure you know well what am i going to think of it and yet i smelled it and i thought oh now this is really this is interesting. Um, this is a a tropical fruit perfume that just kind of blew my mind of, in terms of just how absolutely rich, decadent, strange, kind of episodic, almost kind of narrative it was. There's something about it that really kind of flipped a switch for me, or it was just not what I expected it to be. Um, it was like a sort of really seductive, velvety, musky kind of fruit fragrance which i just don't expect that stuff a lot of fruit fragrances for me just end up as kind of a um how can i say like a, a um they're either too bright or they're just really really dark and woody you know but this is somewhere in that middle range and um i thought it was really exciting and it was definitely something i hadn't smelled before 
and I hope I didn't steal any of your fire there if you were going to like go right out with it was on my list it was on my list but I'm really glad you did <laughs> but say something it... about it too because I think you I, I I think we it's 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 interesting that we both put it in our sort of tops of 2003 yeah. I think Eris and um, Antoine Lee are just doing such great perfumery. Um, I smell, you know, I think all their fragrances have something really interesting to say. Mm. I think um, Delta of Venus was really unexpected. It's, I find it a really textural perfume. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of interesting um, kind of changing facets in there that I find really interesting. Um, and with fruit, like really, really fruity perfumes, I think they sometimes struggle to remain classy and elegant and sophisticated. And somehow, Delta work, walks that really narrow line of being fruity but still being elegant, which, um, you know, I don't underestimate how hard that is to do. Um, and it feels fresh, it feels like a different take, it feels um yeah like they've they've brought something new and that's that's difficult as well so i really do yeah. applaud them um i think it's a a really super interesting fragrance it's worth smelling even if you don't like it even if you don't want to wear it it's worth a sniff um just to see what's going on with it um and it it's a scent that brings a smile to my face every time i smell it you know i do smile and i I think one of the things for me about this last year has been, I think there's been a tone in perfumery, which is about being slightly more lighthearted, which is about um, alleviating some of the dreadful things in the world around us. You know, it, it's about um, giving us a lift, which I think it always has, but that feels like it's entering a new chapter at the moment. And certainly Delta of Venus by Eris is one of those scents that, I feel a little bit happier having smelled. Yeah. What else have you um have you smelled uh that you wanted to share? So so on that sort of theme, which is uh how would I sort of characterize it? It's sort of slightly powdery, slightly fruity scents or very fruity scents. There's been a bit of a raft of them. So um this is a new release, Psychedelicious, which I think is a terrible name, uh, by Coraterno. But it's a really fun perfume. So this um, was sent to me by the brand to try. It's um, kind of berries and a powderiness. It feels like a little bit... So one of the reviewers on... Um, one of the uh, public reviews on Fragrantica... Um, likened it to a type of Delina. And I can see that. It doesn't smell like Delina to me, but I can see that. In that it feels a little bit like there's some exploration going on of what the next trend is going to be around fruity things. Um, and I just find like delicious, really fun. It's really, it's the sort of perfume that you could wear at 18 or 84. You know, it, it's for youthful people uh, you, you know people with a youthful outlook it's got that kind of fun exuberance to it but without being without beating me over the head it's without being too like saccharine twee sweet there's a sort of there's a bit of an edge to it which i really like um and in a very similar vein i've just got this new pierre guillaume and it wouldn't be a fragrantica talks unless we mentioned a pierre guillaume fragrance this is orchid ivy 21.1 again like what's going on with the names um and this is the thing that i love about this is that it has a massive raspberry kind of note in nestled in the heart as well as being surrounded by green things that like winnie's just woken up if you can see a, a little tail wag going on it's um, <laughs> <laughs> just like i've got a tail on my shoulder um and Oh, we're just going to destroy the bed for a minute. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so this has got a really lovely, voluminous, voluptuous raspberry in the middle, which I just can't get enough of because it's surrounded by green notes, because it's surrounded by uh, this kind of ivy, um, this leathery greenery. It's, 
the raspberry isn't too sweet and it has that real realistic smell to it as if you've just crushed raspberries um i really like this i, I haven't always you know to be fair although i am a pierre fan girl i haven't always loved his fruity scents um i don't think i own i can't think of any particularly fruity um pierre guillaume's that i own um but this one is is lovely really really nice so um yeah i've been very pleased with that and then taking us back a couple of months i'm going to get through three in really quick succession astrophil and stella's sweet pulp again hmm. no, i was yeah. curious about this one really curious yeah. about sweet pulp. it's i i to me pulp has a sort of um, overripe connotation mm -hmm. and this doesn't smell overripe it smells it's got a kind of caramelliness to it and it's got a dryness to it um which i found really interesting and um I, it's a scent that i really enjoy wearing actually particularly at this time of year where it's a bit you know we're not out of the woods in terms of the winter weather yet it, it's dark this feels like you're just spraying on some lovely summer sunshine and again you know it's a scent that lifts me up just makes me feel a little bit more cheerful um it's not dark and somber and heavy it's just very easy there's something about all these fragrances that i've mentioned so far that are just very easy and like what they're bringing to people's lives is a kind of an ease and a calmness and a relaxation rather than let's wear something really demanding and challenging and heavy, which of course there's a place for. But the, I, I don't know, the, it feels to me like there's a this tone happening in perfume that's like, let's make people feel a little bit better, a little bit more cheerful, um, if we can. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting you say that too, because I feel as though um, th that you can do that without necessarily becoming unserious. Like you can actually... You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't mean that everything suddenly becomes frivolous, but you can actually just sort of create an entry point that isn't always so heavy and ponderous, you know, because I mean, I, I generally tend to gravitate toward more, you know, personally, like, well, woodier perfumes or incense perfumes or resiny perfumes and all that. But I love when you can, you know, kind of, you know, enter into into fragrance and, and new releases and things that are are just, you know, a little more generally optimistic or sunnier or breezier, which is probably why I also just have this great love for summer, summer perfumes, because they are just right out the gate. They're just very, you know, kind of bright and, you know, the opposite of all that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've got some more, but I'm, I'm interested what else you've got on your slate, John. Well, you know, this is really funny because this is a first for us, although it isn't a first because Pierre Guillaume comes up so much. But I was really excited by a, a Pierre Guillaume or a Parf Parfumerie Générale uh, fragrance, which is part of... Does, are those two separate lines for him or are they the same line? No, so I think I think the, Parfumerie Générale was what it was kind of originally called. And then it went to just being PG. Um <laughs> I think he kind of just reconciled the branding into this PG kind of brand. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, for, 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 for those of us like myself who are not in quite the know that, that you and Adam are, but um, so when I was doing this whole assessment of like, what was good this past year, I came across the a Pierre Guillaume fragrance. that was like, Whoa, that's good. Um, which was um, Tigre d'eau or, you know, tiger water or whatever that is, um, which was one of those things that tickles this completely opposite funny bone. Like I was saying for me, which is that like fresh, watery, coconutty, tropical, like sun blaring down on you type of fragrance that it's just like, and I know he does those kind of islandy perfumes and he's so good at that. Like the few of his that, that he's done that smell like that, I feel are very, very good um, what he does. And this was is really, really amazing and beautiful. And it's fairly simple. Um, but at the same time, I feel like, people don't make a lot of perfumes like that or they don't how can i how can i say this there are plenty of perfumes like that on the market but they're they're often not given that sort of extra artistic touch and i like when when somebody who's as artistic as he is approaches that kind of a palette and then he adds in like little touches of unusual things to it that just kind of elevates it into a whole new territory and so um 
this this was really fun to to wear and i think i'll probably um get a full bottle of it at some point because I, I could see myself just you know like going crazy with sprays on it but um this was really really enjoyable and it also made me feel very optimistic so to your point about just like cheerier brighter perfumes this was was definitely something um another fragrance that i think made a, I, i'm finding it made a big impression on a lot of people and it's getting talked about a lot and I was at first wondering like, oh, what's the big fuss about this? You know, and then I, and I got a sample and I said, oh my God, this actually is warranted. This is really, it's um this fragrance by um, Roberto Greco called uh, Rook or Rook, Rock, which it's a limited edition. I think there's 500 of them made. There's still some floating out there. Um, and uh, it's crazy. It comes in this really wildly retro sort of 70s bottle like this crazy sort of like men's like something your dad would have had on his dresser kind of a bottle um which in itself is sort of part of the fun of this right um but it's this insane kind of mushroomy uh, sort of fougerish thing that has like kind of rotted leaves uh narcissus dandelions amber like it's a lot of this like i want to call it kind of joyful decay if you will um uh, musical decay so it's sort of like uh it, it's not at all an, an unhappy thing it's a it's a it's a beautiful perfume and and i what what intrigues me too is that um the guy who made this is primarily a photographer and what's so interesting is i think his whole shtick if you will in creating this bottle with these sort of ridges throughout here um he the 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 fragrance comes with a book of images and part of the image imagery are photographs of objects as seen through you know sort of ridges of of glass with ridges for example so it's sort of a in in a an attempt at sur a bit of surrealism both in perfume and in imagery which i thought was really really cool um, and then to read some of the um, the the copy about how he worked on this with Christopher Sheldrake, it seemed like they were really pushing themselves to say, let's make it weirder, let's make it weirder and weirder, and um, and they did, but it's utterly wearable. It's completely wearable. Hey, 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 little, hey, little honey. <laughs> um, and um, what I what I found is so fun is it's kind of neat to see. Also, a, um, a fragrance take on a bit of a phenomenal, a phenomenological aspect where a lot of people are responding to it in a bit of a group, uh, um, I don't know, sort of a group happiness, a group hug kind of thing or something, you know, like a lot of people are saying, this is really great. This is like a, you know, a moment. We're sharing a moment. And I, and I enjoyed that aspect of it. You know, I think a lot of us have been like, yeah, I'm going to get on board and I don't mind. I don't care if I'm a populist, you know. <laughs> it sounds brilliant it sounds really interesting it's very interesting i i really and i'm not you know i'm usually not one to be like oh yeah that new trend is the coolest thing I, you know but i yeah it was totally it's totally interesting it really is. yeah what well, yeah. is so funny like towards the end of the year i did order sort of like a little bag of samples of some of the things that i've been hearing people get excited about or just things that i'd seen you know sort of casually crossing the new releases list and thought to myself, like, bookmark that for later, right? Explore these, make sure you stay up to date at some point, even if you don't have the time for it right now. Uh, and um, Rook from Roberto Gre Greco is in that bag sitting upstairs for me right now. Um, I'm very excited for that. Um, but you had talked about, uh, is it is it Lo de Tigre from Pierre Guillaume? Is that yes. it? Yes, yeah. Um, that... I did try just the other day for my little grab bag of samples and I couldn't agree more. It's a very exciting release. Um, yeah. That's saying something from a house that has so many releases. <laughs> exactly um, right. <laughs> it, it is um, everything you described it as, of course, but something that really struck me about that particular release is that it's, uh, it strikes me as very friendly to those who want to kind of explore the niche territory of, of fragrances. It strikes me as like a good stepping stone um, perfume if you have more experience with like the designer world, because uh, if you are a person who enjoys like, not just fougeres in general, not just like the flat fougere genre, but more so the 
the dynamic modern fougere, the, the one that's very aromachemical driven, that uh, has some tonka in it, but also has some of those like, that some of that sheerness that we associate with modern fragrance, where it's not necessarily this big, thick, powdery wall, but it's got, you know, maybe some aldehy aldehydic touches, maybe it's got, you know, more of a focus on the herbs themselves, that kind of thing. Maybe the lavender is sort of the star of the show. If you are a fan of those kinds of modern designer fougeres, I think you'll really find something dynamic about this release from Pierre because it is uh, very textural insofar as it has that like tonka, semi-powdery, semi-sweet kind of base, but then it has some of those like modern synthetics that drive it and 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 project it off the skin in a very mm -hmm. um friendly not too extreme not too quiet way um and i just think that people who are really fond of some of those like you know modern masculine leaning you know designer releases will probably have an easy time understanding this this creation right and the fact that There's also this coconut water quality um, that I think fans of what's that really Silver Mountain water from Mm -hmm. Eat, from uh from Creek Green. Right? they might recognize a little touch of that in this in this release and, and find some um, commonalities there, some things to latch on to. So I think it's a very friendly, as we have come, have come to expect from Pierre, a friendly release that um, bridges many gaps in the market and, and um, makes many you know, stepping stones available for those who haven't really dipped their toes much into the niche. Mm. Yeah, I think Pierre does that so well. It, you know, bridges that gap between artistic and friendly and um, they're, they're just approachable. They're not snobby. They're not um, totally esoteric and weird. They're artistic, but yet they've got a real approachability about them. And I just think he, he, he does that so well. Um, so yeah. So what else did the two of you find impactful? And I'm curious to, to kind of to help us sort of determine who, who talks about a release next. I'm curious, did either of you find something over the last few months to a year, um, really made a mark on a personal situation, right? Did you, did you carry away from a situation where you wore one of these new releases thinking, I'm going to maybe remember this experience a little bit more than I would have as a result of wearing something along with it that made an impression on me. I have a I have a thought there. It's not a particular new release, but it's an interesting. Well, you can tell me later. Like, no, John, that doesn't belong here. But but I think this might work here. I this is a is is is, is sort of a classic new niche perfume, but like. I just never owned it and I just got it recently. And I'm like, how did, you know, how did I just not have this for all these years? But I think it's kind of impactful and interesting, but I just got, you know, my, my very first bottle, which for some might seem like what of, um, Muscrava Jour from, right. From Frederick Mall, which I think everybody in the world has, or I shouldn't say everybody in the world has, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, this is sort of considered, you know, a must have by many folks. Right. You know, and, I mean, it was interesting for me to, to, and I and I wore this all day one day when I was in Maine recently, and I was like, you know, isn't it funny how for the longest time this was talked about on Fragantica everywhere for for you know long periods of time, everybody saying, you know, how how could one not have this bomb of musk and spices, and you know, it's like autumn in a bottle, it's this that or the other thing, and um, you know, then it kind of got quiet quieter because every a lot of people bought it or whatever um and it's interesting i think to go back to something that was at one time a sort of trendsetter right and then um to realize whoa this is crazy like if it were re-released new or with a new name on it like i, I know they just renamed one of their perfumes but you know people be like whoa what's this crazy spice thing but i guess that's what would in intrigue me is how you know some of these perfumes that were so groundbreaking were groundbreaking for a reason. You know what I mean? There, there's something, and it, it it was a really pleasant experience for me. And yes, I have a lot of really happy associations with this because I think I often will pair a new perfume and I was in a, a somewhat new, not, I'm not a, in Portland that much. And I, I kind of bound those experiences together of like, huh, I'm, I'm not used to smelling this, but I'm also in this kind of new environment that I'm enjoying a lot. And um, it was sort of nice to bind 
that city with this fragrance, which has been around for a while, but new to me. And um, that was really pleasant. It was a very pleasant experience for me. What about yeah, you? I think it's always good to like revisit perfumes after a while, whether they're, you know, huge trendsetters or not. In the rush for the new, I think it's really possible um, and probably even, you know, inevitable that we overlook some real brilliant perfumes that came out five, ten or more years ago that you just think, damn, that is a good perfume. And I do think it's worth slowing down sometimes and taking the time to to go back um, and to revisit and to rethink because you, you can really uncover some absolute gems that way. Yeah, I think so too. Was there anything that you wore um, this year that you felt was, um, Nicola, that was like very, like you really have really strong positive associations with or important associations with? So uh, something I've, I've ended up reaching for an awful lot actually is um, Sarah Baker launched an X-ray version of Flame and Fortune. Mm. So this Flame and Fortune was originally her, in her, slightly less fulsome line um mm -hmm. i think it was an edt um and yeah i mean to be fair i never felt i never wore it and thought this feels like a thin perfume but she's brought out this um extra version which is just lovely and mm. um, i wore this a lot over christmas i i, I really love the the smoky quality, it's, it's got this kind of duality of um, kind of a floral aspect, but then this dirty, seedy, petrol-y kind of um, background. And it's I mean, it sounds horrible when I talk about it in those terms, but it's lovely. And the two throw light and shade onto each other. So I think the floral aspect would perhaps seem a little bit trite if it wasn't for the smoke and the dirt. And the dirt seems more shadowy and interesting because of the floral aspect. And I'm just really glad that she's brought it out in the higher concentration because it is a, a perfume that I really enjoy. I feel that at this concentration, it's a little bit, it, it gives it that extra dimension um longevity was good before and now it's excellent um so yeah I, th I i do think it's a really good perfume i also wore quite a lot um celine by manos gerakinis that was a new mm -hmm. release from him mm -hmm. i think he's just doing really nice stuff at the minute um mm -hmm. i i said to him that that that, that fragrance smelled like uh, the the scent of being on holiday with your friends and that's sort of that again going back to that cheerfulness that relaxed vibe that i think is really nice um to be be reminded of in perfume you know like exactly like we said it doesn't have to be serious and somber all the time it can have mm. a lighthearted side and so yeah i i really enjoyed that too um there's one that i i want to bring up and i want i want to see if either of you've smelt it because mm. oh i feel so conflicted about it so, Mattia Premier's vanilla powder. Have you guys tried it at all? I have not. No. So, have you heard the expression "fit on paper"? <laughs> on paper. Yeah, it fit on paper. Like, like it means it, it smells good on paper. Well, no, 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 well, good. <laughs> well, like if, if somebody's fit on paper, like when you describe them, they sound like super sound, attractive. Right. But right, in real right. life, they're not. And to me, <laughs> I should love vanilla powder. You know, it, it should be mm -hmm. right at the centre of my wheelhouse. It's a really good quality vanilla mm -hmm. uh, with obviously powdery elements. It's got a kind of coconutty, husky vibe to it. Oh, and I just, I just can't get on with it. Like, mm. and I'd be really interested if other Fragrantica um, listeners and readers have a similar um, experience. I'm a fan of the house. I think they've done some absolutely brilliant perfumes, French mm -hmm. flower. Uh, also suave i love both of those vanilla powder really anticipated um got it on my skin and thought this smells like sweat uh, it's got this real 
sweaty quality and I can't work out where it's coming from. Uh -huh. Other people, it smells lovely. I don't know if it's just me. On the blotter, I get sort of a midway between lovely and sweaty and I oh, I keep going around the houses about it. I keep putting it on one side to then go back to, you know, was it something I ate that week that, and yeah, I just, I don't know what's what it, to think. What's it called again? Sorry, vanilla? Vanilla powder. Powder, right, okay. Yeah, it's <laughs> peculiar. It's peculiar. It's, I think that's my, uh, my kind of uh, take on it, really. I, I would be curious to try that now, Nicola. Because, and I, I do wonder though, because it, you know these these notes. Whenever we talk about notes and fragrance, sometimes it, it's sort of a it's almost like a misnomer to call one thing it's by itself. Like your vanilla could be a very different type of vanilla if natural vanilla is used, or different accords of vanilla, different interpretations of that note in one fragrance might be very different in another, of course. But, you know, I wonder if there is something of a commonality between the vanilla that you're describing and that fragrance to the fragrance that I had a similar reaction to where on paper it sounded right up my street and then didn't quite deliver, um, which was Harvest Mouse from Zoologist. I thought that that would be maybe a new favorite based solely on what I had read about it and its construction, the notes on paper, as it were. Um, I'm not sure if I dislike it maybe as much as you like or dislike this new Métier Premier uh, perfume, but um, I I feel like it's one of those fragrances, this Harvest Mouse, that challenges you over and over again where you might like parts of it and you might find parts of it really fascinating and then other parts just so underwhelming and you're, and you're like, wow, well, how can one feel this complicated about something so so often yes or no as sent? Um, but no, uh, this is, you know, I, I guess to Harvest Mouse's credit, um, it's not an all out dislike. It's just sort of a really like toothsome explorational problem for me where I, I want to like so much of it and I don't end up liking so much of it and then I do like some other parts of it and I'm going back and forth on it constantly but there it's definitely resolves in the base to a, a big vanilla and resinous kind of note and I'm curious to know if there's like a through line that's just coincidental about what you're describing about that fragrance to this one um but yeah I, I really would have pegged you as enjoying from what you've described I would I would have pegged you as enjoying it too yeah, and I think there are, you know, in a similar way, there are elements of it that I like or that I really want to like, but it's just, I don't know, it's just not quite working for me at the moment. And maybe, you know, maybe if I put it away for six months and I go back to it um, in six months' time, I will be like, yeah, actually, now it is working for me. Um, but, yeah, it's odd. It's really odd. Hmm. Interesting. What so else have you got? Oh, I just had one more, and then I wanted to um, ask a bit um, about Adam and what he's been smelling. So there was a really um, a lovely fragrance that uh, came out last year that I've enjoyed. And, and we talked a lot about fruit in perfumes this year, and, and this was uh, one that um, was really great. This is uh, Tonka Peach, and this was from um, um, Pearlescent, the Pearlescent Collection from Gallagher Perfumes, which is a American perfume company. Um and what I really like about this is uh, it's it's fairly, you know, true to its name, it has Tonka. And it's just got this like absolutely like just crazy sort of champagne and peach mixed together opening, which is nuts. It's so it's so attractive. Like it's the word I want to use. It's just like it's sort of like the, the I want to liken it to um, all of the best associations you have of like walking into a restaurant or a pub or, or some sort of a place where people are enjoying themselves and you smell that like sort of punch of, of drinks in the air in that really happy way, not like, you know, a bar where it's just like, you know, smell beer, you know, but this is really like that great smell of like champagne being corked open and stuff. It's just, it's so effervescent. And with just a little bit of peach right behind that first like burst, ah, it's so good. And then, and then it just kind of simple, it kind of goes into this simple bit of rose um, and a sort of sandalwood type base, just just the tiniest bit of gourmand, a little bit of vanilla, 
And it does what it does so well. Um, and it's so damn pleasant and um, not overly sweet. I mean, it's just gently sweet. I know I just I get it was so pleasant it was so pleasurable to to experience this and wear it and um I really really liked it and also you know it it kind of was ple- it was ple- pleasant for me too because there was a, a fragrance I, I adore which has been discontinued and that was from the um come to garçon series red and they you know they did these sort of color series and they did one of red rose which is this very champagne smelling rose um and I've never smelled anything that came close to it this is the first thing that even barely touches that comes close to that and there was another i should say also there's a perfume called um um by um liquid imaginaire um dom rosa which also comes a little bit close to it which i wrote about in that champagne article but the two of them within one year i'm like oh, i found i found some stuff that smells like that um but it's really pleasant really beautiful it's another case of like fruit making maybe fruit is coming back in a more slightly more mm-hmm. serious way so it, we don't feel like they're just perfumes for kids anyway yeah 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 let's hope so let's hope so yeah. i've just got two to finish up with before yeah, we on adams so just what i wanted to flag um 2787 i've got a new release out called per se which is a really sort of sheer metallic iris um it's interesting because I think it, this will really appeal to people who like that crisp white shirt type scent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is quite modern. It is quite clean, but worth a smell if you like that that kind of crispness. And then just a brand that were recommended to me by um, actually another perfume house. And I think that's one of the lovely things about the niche sector is that um, – different perfume houses do support each other and they do kind of try and bolster each other. So this is from a brand that are Ukrainian and the perfumer has um, fled the war and moved to, certainly for the moment, to the UK. Um, Mm -hmm. And she's brought out a perfume called Invincible, which um, is a tribute to the Ukrainian people. And it's this lovely... It's like a bouquet of spices. It's so multifaceted and it's got, you know, in the base, this is the base alone, it's got myrrh, a poponax, labdanum, vanilla, patchouli, amber, musk. And you can smell every single one of those ingredients if you smell the dry down. Um, mm. I've been, the, the house is called Centire. Um, as I said, they're, they're new to me, Um this is it. I think Invincible was came out in 2023. Um, a house that I think has got real potential and one that's definitely worth watching in the in the indie side of things and the niche side of things. So, yeah, shout out to them because I'm, I'm impressed so far from what I've smelled. Great. Well, you know, 2787's per se release, that was actually one of the things that um, I... I, I kind of wrapped my head around and got to sample um, pretty immediately once I started to feel a little bit more leveled out after after our son was born, where um, I just had that that sort of feeling of confidence to go back into things and in, in, in the that are happening in the fragrance realm. And it just so happened that that fragrance was receiving a wide release and I was just really curious about it. They sent me a sample and I really, really enjoyed it. And it's really no surprise that I do because there are parts of it that kind of, to me, they they might not blatantly reference, but they remind me of a long discontinued Atelier Cologne fragrance. that's a favorite of mine that they're um, uh, uh, Iris Rebel, right? Where it's like that peppery, drier, um, spiced iris that um, isn't very sweet or isn't very powdery. It's a very kind of um, almost aquatic take on on that that note, and I really enjoy that. Um, it's one of the few iris um, interpretations that I find myself just naturally gravitated to. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I must say, like, what a pleasure it is to kind of catch up on all these releases with the two of you, because I, I think part of me really wanted to write a 2023 like best of list like most you know fragrantica editors and contributors do at the end of the year uh this year but i, I felt an immense sense of guilt because i really hadn't 
been keeping up with new releases. Uh, and similarly with recording, I, I felt a little nervous coming into today, not because of either of you, you two make me feel very comfortable, but the idea that, you know, exploring something after being out of the scene a little bit um, was a little intimidating, but, you know, scent is such a universal language and it's, and hearing you describe what you've enjoyed about these releases has been really exciting and uh, reinvigorating for me in, in terms of the hobby and in terms of the, the, the subject. So it's been, it's been a pleasure hearing about these things. I wanted to, um, to touch on what I was reaching for the few times I really made, um, you know, important quote unquote, <laughs> that's a relative term, uh, decisions about what I was going to wear, um, over the last few months. Um, you know, understandably my focus has really not, not been on too much else besides, you know, our, our, our son. Um, and he's been such a joy. And so whenever I reach for sense now, I kind of think to myself, is this more of like a comment on my personality than it ever has been before in many respects? Like, am I, there's another person in our lives now, my, my wife and I's lives mm -hmm. now. And so I'm just like, well, it, d should I choose something that, you know, is, is, you know, m maybe speaking to elements of calm, elements of safety, elements of, you know, oh, personality so traits that you'd want in a parent. And so I, I, I have been trying to kind of explore that idea you know, obviously people talk about re referencing their parents to a certain smell, you know, and I don't really think that's going to be possible with me because I do <laughs> like a lot of scent. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, our son is going to have like one thing that he associates me with, maybe down the line, but for the foreseeable future, I don't see that as a possibility. So instead of maybe thinking of me down the line when he's a bit older with one smell, I'd like to maybe give him some, you know, maybe different associations based on what I've been exploring, but also, you know, should there be a common theme running through what I choose more days than not? Um, and, and so far the answer has been kind of, uh, and more specifically through the, the lens of fragrances that have keenly a balance of relaxing yet you know invigorating um you know when, when you picture a fougere for example many people associate fougeres with with like parent aged men um i don't necessarily you know i i get why we associate that but um i haven't been seeing my selections through that lens as much as i have been through um notes like reliable spices you know nutmegs calming comforting spices not too sweet um and obviously as the the season has progressed from when he was born in the fall to now we're in you know midwinter and uh, i i am reaching for some you know colder weather staples but i'm still trying to do so through the the lens of like well you know what am i communicating through this and am i communicating like a peaceful not too you know over over stimulating but not bland either kind of lens and so some selections um include things like this this is a blocky's press club and um you know this is kind of like an array of spices but set against some 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 base notes that i think kind of reference a fougere quality without like leaning too heavily in that direction um, there's something familiar about the way it smells. I think it smells kind of like what many people would associate with like a fatherly kind of scent, um, for lack of a better term, insofar as, like I said, it's sort of smoothed over. Uh, it smells like somebody who wears tweed. <laughs> so, like, it's like, um, but it, it, it's comforting and um, it smells safe to me. And so that's been one um, one selection I've been reaching over and over again for Press Club from Blocky. Um, another thing recently is uh, Sir, a Serge Lutens fragrance. And I know that many people, when they come into the hobby, they eventually discover Serge, even if they're not necessarily the most like niche uh, affiliated uh, scent lover, because Serge is just everywhere um, in the discourse about scent. Um, but and it's been interesting to go back to something that I think once you find Serge, a lot of people tend to, you know, 
go on and on about is Shergi. Um, mm. It's been a wonderful choice for this time in my life because it, again, it has sort of a comforting scent, but it's not like it's overly sweet, overly powdery, overly spicy. There's some tobacco and hay references, but it's not like a big dank scent. Uh, it just sort of blends into the background and feels, again, kind of safe in a way to me. Not not safe as in overly easy to wear, but safe as in um, the person who wears this probably isn't doing anything that's going to risk your life. <laughs> um, and th th that's not to say that I haven't been um, reaching for things that are a little bit more, um, I don't, how do I put this? like risky, I guess. Like th th sometimes you feel like you're in a in a dark mood or you feel like you're in a uh, a mood where you have strong opinions or something like that. And um, when I'm feeling that way lately, I'm reaching for, of course, another Pierre Guillaume, uh, Noir Akume, which is this like kind of almost poisonous smelling dark amalgamation of like black tea and uh, orris root, and um, some like very, very dark Tonka-like, uh, Tonka-adjacent notes insofar as it's not quite vanilla, it's not quite tobacco, it's not quite sweet, it's not quite bitter. Those are like the, I think it's a very abstract scent. So I, I'm using these abstract ways to describe it because that seems the most fitting. Um, Nicola, have you ever smelled this one, Noir Kume? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, I'm probably doing a miserable job of describing it. I'd be curious to know what you think of it. No, I think I think you're doing a good job of describing it. It is. It's 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 sort of dark, but without being threatening. Somehow, it, it's um, it's a sort of a twilighty sort of scent rather than a witching hour scent. Right, right, right. And, and even, mm. yeah, even less <laughs> a specific way of describing it. Well, well, Pierre, Pierre just has a way of like kind of making sense that just sort of hover on you and, and they don't always maybe commit to one particular note all the time. And and black tea certainly feels like the star of the show, but it doesn't necessarily scream tea scent to me. Uh, the it, It's like that funky oolong and, and, and black tea quality that like explores like the tannins and like the, the darker aspects of tea without necessarily, you know, too much of that like over sweet, over friendly, uh, friendliness but I, I do like you said there is something strangely comforting about it as well and uh, that's probably you know fitting fitting my theme thus far um, when the weather was still a bit warmer I was reaching regularly for for this J scent fragrance called Haka um, I discovered it earlier in the year uh, while the weather was still pretty hot and I've just been you know absolutely obsessed with it it is I mean it's peppermint in a bottle it's aggressively minty. Um, so if you don't like mint at all, then this is just not for you. But uh, it, it has like that kind of familiar, comforting cocktail of like white musks that just sort of carry it to its end on your skin. And it's nice. It's just very um, cleanly and, and, and yet somehow referencing that like bitterness that you find in like crushed fresh herbs. And that's really gratifying for me lately. Um, even as the weather turned cold. Um, and then finally, something that I've been resting on as a as a mainstay since I discovered it a year and a half or two ago uh, is is Rock River Melody from from uh, Regime de Fleurs. Uh, this is something that I think I did explore in a previous article, if I'm not mistaken, about how it, so, yeah. Yeah. it reminds me of like the discourse surrounding like gender in, in perfume and and for me it, it does feel like it explores like masculinity but in a very interesting way um and and nothing about it is you know mashing you over the head like many you know overtly masculine releases tend to and that's what's really interesting about it to me it's you know a big lavender and herbaceous uh balmy kind of scent with again sort of a something understated about it which makes it feel more comforting and more um, alluring, but not, you know, not necessarily in a electric way, just sort of in a constant way. Um, and it's sort of softened by some ambery tones as well. Um, I actually think that fans of those kinds of 
spicy but not sweet sense would probably love Rock River Melody and Press Club from, from Blocky. I, I think these are two very complementary fragrances where maybe Regime de Fleurs is a little bit better in slightly warmer weather and then maybe the, the Blocky perfume is a bit better in the slightly cooler temperatures, but um, that's all relative, of course, too. But I really think there's, um, if you're going to draw a through line through those scents that I mentioned, it would be, you know, part A to part B, right? Where um, vaguely spicy, vaguely comforting, but, you know, not necessarily committing to um, any any note or any note profile that is extremely one texture or one level of sweetness, one um, temperature or another. In fact, I was going to say that it's interesting when you mentioned the Regime de Fleur, when you mentioned Rock River Melody, I'll, I found that because I've smelled a number of samples of the uh, um, Regime de Fleur perfumes, and they they have this quality that I like about all of them, which is this kind of, it's almost like, to, I always, to my mind, I call it a humming sensation, where it's sort of like, there isn't this one, like none of them are a tribute to this one thing, and then there's a bunch of little details around it. Like, it kind of feels like it's, part of a like a sine wave of different things that are kind of floating along together um so it and so it, it's not like dramatic contrast of one thing up and down it's more like a hum of something where the the sine wave is closer together if that makes sense and um so i could sort of see you reaching for something like that and also like the blocky perfumes are really like sophisticated and very like to my mind very there's a smoothness to them and there's like a um like they're they're yeah like i could see i'm not that i'm saying like you're thinking like oh god i don't want to frighten the child or something but in a way right you kind of i could see myself reaching for something that you know is a rich experience but not too like abrasive or weird or having these like sharp like top notes or you know what i'm saying like i and, and i'm not sure i don't want to you know presume that that's what you're thinking like no not screaming aldehydes not this or that you know but i could see like a, a lot of the blocky fragrances are just like they're so they're really sophisticated and smooth and you know like i just smelled their most recent one too from at sense explorer um which you both probably would love this thing called brazilian lily which is like one of those like it's it's a floral which is like a little bit of spice you know just enough to like make it you know like really really nice but it's of that same ilk so um they all sound really like really nice like really nice choices so. yeah i have you tried um beyond the wall by gritty no, I haven't really explored much of the gritty line yet. I, I beyond the wall, what is that like? Yeah, so it's kind of um, milk and spices. Because I, I wondered if that might go with your, your kind of current theme. It, it's not too sweet, but it has got some sweetness, and it, it's really I find it really soothing. It's one that I quite often wear to bed. Um, it's lovely, really kind of a latte type perfume. I'm thinking yeah. of the wall in Game of Thrones and what's beyond it. So that, yeah. that's probably yeah. not the tone that you that you're saying this fragrance uh, no, no. exhibits. It's much less, yeah, much less sinister than that. Um, but I was really interested actually in what you were saying about um, how your little boy won't associate you with one specific smell. And I, I thought, and it's a question to both of you really. If you think of the concept of father. Not necessarily your father's, but if you think of the concept of father, are there any particular notes or smells that spring to mind? Mm, I mean, for me, right off, I think of lavender. Like, uh, you know, that definitely something I associate. Well, you know, it's funny, but it, there's there's sort of those like spring. It's interesting, but I, I guess there, there's, I do think of some things right right off the bat, which are probably things that I do associate a bit with my father but I do think I associate with with probably fathers generally and they they tend to be like spring flowers which are have just traditionally been involved in a lot of fougeres I mean things like lilac things like lavender um then also you know things like musk or then clary sage I, I guess I do maybe think about those things and there's a kind of there, and, and maybe that's why I've always had a kind of interest in the fougere because to me it's that absolute sort of teeter-totter of you know the kind of um cold bracing um beginning but also that really soft powdery comforty spot comforting spot um as well because it, it has both of those and, and that sort of hay and 
Tonka like, you know, softness as well. So that to me always says like has a fatherly aspect to it always. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't really differentiate my response too much from, from John, just because I think you hit the nail on the head for me as well. But to, to further accentuate what you were saying, I guess what we're learning is some kind of herb combined with some kind of spice and, and some kind of floral and the combination of those three elements being right in that kind of zone of bad. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is, isn't it? It's funny how that, yeah. Is it, but I'm curious, do you have a similar, are you in a similar place too, Nicola? Like, do you have um, a similar place? No, I think I'm slightly different in that I, mm. when I think of it, I think um, vetiver, that, you mm. know, when vetiver is really um, dry. Mm. Uh, so yeah, vetiver and spices and uh, a kind of old spice, you know, that really, really dry spice that's quite aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a sort of soap smell. Mm -hmm. I think dad's just smell of soap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder if you can track that back to what scents were popular at the time we were growing up, potentially. I mean, I know that's a bit different because Adam's a youngster, but um you know like i think perhaps me and john are i don't know perhaps me and john are of a similar age who knows <laughs> um, a older every day i'll tell you that much Nick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i wonder if there's a kind of yeah what was popular in in my neck of the woods and in your neck of the woods might have been slightly different who knows but yeah, yeah it was it was interesting I, I i once interviewed a perfumer from um i want to hope i get this correct but he's he lives in one of the former soviet republics in the caucasus region and uh he you know he built a very interesting story about trying to recreate the smell of his father and it and it had very interesting aspects of like you know pipe tobacco and a bit of like fuel um and it was a lot of things associated with very much like the time and you know things like i think there was a, a hint of like coal fires and like Think you know uh, uh, very much about the where he lived and, and the, like the how they the kind of transport they took and like you know all of that kind of stuff you know is very much built into the to the to the his whole general smell of like what when his father took his coat off what did the coat smell like kind of you know that sort of thing um, and it was it was very interesting to me and I did start it made me think gosh I wonder what the smell is like around the world you know because obviously it'll be different you know depending upon where you're your your place of origin is and all that and um and of course i thought too like wouldn't it be fascinating if there were some universals in there as well too you know that we you know we don't know about but um or some great research project there of course um yeah absolutely yeah. um adam um i was thinking for a moment that you might say that you were reaching for a um chamomile and custard perfume or something like <laughs> too <laughs> um, that would be bad i mean i, I I, I really do like the idea of something relying on like that egg custard kind of rich vanilla quality without actually being very sweet, but mm -hmm. accented and sort of risen up by something very agrastic and herbal. Like, it would be a very <laughs> interesting uh, scent experiment and perhaps a good January scent project release, I dare say. Absolutely fascinating. I, I will get right on it, but I love that idea of just being able to list as a note egg. It would be, <laughs> <laughs> would be, would be wonderful. <laughs> that is one of my favorite desserts is that any, any kind of egg custard, like a flan or like a, yeah, yeah. anything kind of egg based custard. I'm, I'm into it. So maybe we have something going there, I think. Yeah, we, this is a good idea. Well, I mean, that took a weird turn, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, unexpected. But isn't that always the case? Yeah, yeah. of course. It's great to have here. Back. Yeah, you know, that's the point, Nicholas. Like we're, we're, we are planning on um, releasing more of these Figurantica talks, chats in the near future. I have, actually, I have one that was long forgotten. Uh, that we had recorded and then I had some file issues sorting through it when I was trying to edit it and I did find a program that kind of let me sort of alleviate those issues and, and sort of find a solution to save the file and not just have it be scrapped uh, so I 
am working on getting that uploaded uh, probably after this one. And then we'll be recording again shortly for um, for the next episode that we already have, I think, all of our scents chosen. And, and I'll give like a little, a little flash of a preview here. What is that mysterious color? Um, you'll have to find out next <laughs> next week on <laughs> Break Around a Good Chance. Um, but no, lovely talking to you both. And uh, let's keep this going. Yeah, same here. Great to see you both and see you all out there again very soon.